Hey guys, Stefan here. Today, this video is about the Bitcoin Standard, the Decentralized Alternative to Central Banking, which is a book by one of my friends, Saif Dean Amus. I think it's a fantastic book, and I just wanted to offer some thoughts on it and give a review just to give people a flavor of what to expect from the book and why you should read this book. Uh, I will show you, so here's the book. I'll put the link in the description, obviously. Um, but why this book? There are a lot of books in the Bitcoin blockchain space, so to speak, but really a lot of those books are approaching it from the wrong angle. They're thinking of it too much as a technology, too much as you know a specific uh, Silicon Valley sort of mindset rather than viewing it from an economic and social phenomenon mindset. And if you don't understand the problem with fiat money and credit expansion, then you won't understand why Bitcoin is so important. So I think it is important to understand sort of from the first principles. So who is this book good for? It's good for obviously newbies to Bitcoin. It's, it's great for anyone who is interested in Austrian economics. And it's also great for anyone who is maybe a bit newer to the problem of money and understanding why what why have we ended up in this you know scenario this situation that we're in now and what would be a better form of money so first we have to understand from first principles why and how money arises on the market right it comes up through a process and safety does great at, as at explaining this by referring to some of the austrian economists who have who have done some of this work so Karl Menger on the origins of money uh, Ludwig von Mises and Murray Rothbard who have all made uh, big contributions in this space so it's it's this concept of saleability and the market spontaneously selecting the most saleable medium of exchange so and we can understand that through sort of the lens of saleability and storing your value through time, but also through the lens of resistance to central control, because that's also become more important in the recent century um, that in a way that it might not have been in the past. So to really understand this, you have to understand the history of how we got here. So Safety does an explanation on this as well, of how money has evolved over time and what has happened is it a good money can be deflationary in the good sense in the sense that your purchasing power is going up over time and that is the way the world was under say the classical gold standard but there's always a tendency there that a government will try to co-opt or control or debase the money and so Gold, in a sense, acted as a check against government overspending. But then what happened over time is that gold's role was weakened. And you can understand that through certain interventions that the government undertook. So examples of that would be legal tender laws, having a central bank, making that central bank the, lend the lender of last resort, giving that central bank more control over the monetary supply, giving that bank this the ability to like allow fractional reserve banking. So that's been one of the problems of history is that the person making the money always had an incentive to go and make more of it. And if in the fractional reserve banking case where there's a certain layer of, let's say, broad or kind of base money, but then issuing more paper claims over and above that then that's where the, this phenomenon of inflation can occur and then the downside of that which can be reduction in your purchasing power obviously but not just that but what we call malinvestment so it creates what we call the boom and bust economic cycle and capital gets misallocated instead of where it should be allocated based on the price signaling system, which in turn reflects the consumer preferences. So that's, in a sense, a bit of the problem of where, of how we got to where we are. And then what are some of the bad outcomes of that? Well, now we live in a world with easy money, 
quote, easy money and easy credit compared to in the past. We don't have, you know, hard money. We've got easy money, meaning it's easy to generate more of it. And because of that, we've created a society that has what we might call a high time preference, as in, think of that like, we're not good at delayed gratification. We want things now and we're not prepared to wait for them. When this is really bad because for civilization, the process of civilization, you could, you could say, is even the process of low time preference. In order to be able to be more productive in the future, there are some ways in which you have to delay your consumption and delay your gratification until later. But in this world of easy money, we don't have that. And so it, it creates other cultural problems like uh, cultural decay. It uh, creates an increased welfare state size. And what that does is it makes people act in ways that are less prudent. They're more likely to make degenerate bad life choices because there's, there's a welfare state that's been run in a way that steals the wealth of the population. So you have to understand as well that in the past that gold and some of these other more hard money in the past acted as a check in that governments could not just openly tax you for this much of your money because tax is obviously very politically unpopular. But what politicians and central bankers were able to do was create a scenario or create a situation where they could kind of, in a sense, stealthily tax you by taxing your accumulated wealth. And that's, again, through this debasement and co-opting of the money supply and revaluing gold, so on and so forth. So you'll need to read the book to get more of the detail around that. Um, but that's kind of, in a nutshell, that's the problem that we're, that we're living in. So where does Bitcoin come in? Bitcoin can come in in that it is more scarce and it is a hard money. So it's, in a sense, it's like economic reality is reasserting itself over the paper money, fiat money world that we live in. And because it is so scarce, and because it is so hard to control or centrally confiscate, then this Bitcoin is now becoming more like the sound money or hard money. So one of the really interesting things is that nobody controls Bitcoin. So in the book, Safe Dean talks about this, um, this, it's like this peer-to-peer -peer network governance. And the problem is there's different groups within Bitcoin, right? So you've got, it's an open source software project. So you've got the coders and you've got the developers who are making, you know, are writing Bitcoin Core and the other software. They can write code, but participants in the Bitcoin space don't have to run that code. They only run that if they, you know, accept the underlying values or the underlying purpose of that code. So there's a bit of a uh, harmony of interest in a sense, but also a clash of interest. So you've got the developers, you've got the nodes and the participants, and then you've got the miners who, in a, they also have to kind of abide by the network consensus that the nodes have chosen. So, but at the same time, th there's, a, there's a bit of a social consensus component to this as well. And that's also a really difficult to understand point. But once you've understood that, then I think Bitcoin becomes a lot easier to understand. So because of those components, as in Bitcoin is the most saleable medium of exchange and nobody controls it. So it's also harder to centrally control or co-opt or change. Then Bitcoin is the best money. And that's, that's kind of the argument. So one of the other really good points is this concept around stock to flow ratio. So what has happened in the past in history is those people who were able to create the new money and say, make a law saying everyone has to use this new money that I just made, they got a benefit out of that. So what happens when we get a money that is created based on an algorithm that nobody controls, it's been set at the start, and has a very set limited supply, well, that's gonna be better for society because less people will be out there trying to make new money and they will instead be spending more time being productive. 
So it helps society in that it helps us lower our time preference and it kind of forces that in a way that nobody can sort of stop but to create an overall better outcome for all of society because instead of everyone trying to make money, now it's more like I want to be productive so that I can get more money or like get more of the sound money, Bitcoin, right? So let me show you a couple um, pages that I thought were interesting that help illustrate this point that Bitcoin is better from a stock to flow ratio. And when I say stock to flow ratio, we're talking the overall supply of something versus the flow which is the amount, let's say, the new amount made per year. So if you compare Bitcoin versus US dollar or Australian dollar or gold, you'll sort of you'll see the argument here that Bitcoin is actually better than all of the others. It's a stronger money. So here you can see, um, yeah. So you can see here uh, the United States dollar money supply growth rate from 1990 to 2015 was 5.45 percent. Uh, and in Australia, it was nine. That same period was nine point one one percent. And if you average it out over an even longer period of time, it's even higher than that. So from nineteen sixty to twenty fifteen, we're talking seven point four percent for the US, ten point six percent for Australia, eleven point three for the UK, eleven. Oh, sorry, ten point two for Japan. So you can see there that those are actually much higher interest uh, in, inflation rates. Now compare this with uh, Bitcoin's supply and growth rate, which you can see here on the screen. So we are in 2018 now. So the annual growth rate is 3.8%. But what you're seeing is Bitcoin will dramatically lower in terms of flow. that new flow rate is dramatically lowering over time. And in the, in the next two years, once we hit the next halving, it will be down to around 1.8%. And I'll show you that statistic here. So if you go to this side, bitcoinblockhalf.com, it's a countdown in terms of when is the next Bitcoin block halving happening, which means the inflation rate of Bitcoin is halving every four years. So you can see here that of the 21 million Bitcoins, 80% have already been mined. The current inflation rate is around 3.96, but once we hit the next halving, it's only gonna be 1.8. And then don't forget, after the next halving, it'll be halved again and halved again, halved again. So you can see here how this is a very good thing from a stock to flow ratio point of view, because it shows you that, uh, uh, here I'll show you one more um, chart. Um, so you can see here, this chart shows stock to flow ratio. So it's saying total, well, rather uh, the stock piles divided by the annual production. So you can see that's the rate that Bitcoin is now, but in 2025, it's gonna be that much more, that much higher, which again, is that vision of how Bitcoin will be a better money in the long run. So the argument that Safety makes is that Bitcoin is the best way to store your value into the future compared to the alternatives, if you wanted to store your value into US dollar, say. So a couple other points that he hits in the book, um, he, hits, he hits on this vision of how Bitcoin could function in the future as a settlement layer between large banks. Uh, it, it is sort of the hard money, the base money. It's seen, it should be seen more as a high powered money. It's not, it's not necessary that every small transaction like me going and buying coffee hits the blockchain. That's not really essential. What we're really talking about here is important transactions. So let's say, you know, you need to leave the country and you need to take your wealth with you. Well, Bitcoin is a, is a good way to do that. If you wanted to send like a hundred thousand dollars or millions of dollars. And our theory is really that in the future, Bitcoin is going to be worth millions. So it's, it's really only going to be useful, like as in on the chain directly on the network to do for large transactions. For small value transactions, they will happen on layers above. And that could be on the Lightning Network or that could be via your retail bank or your company or your service who helps you manage your Bitcoins. But there are ways that it can be done such that it is more decentralized or you get to secure the coins. And so understood in that way, Bitcoin is a, is a defensive technology. It allows more and more people to store value 
in their own way or with themselves rather than it getting centralized. And that was one of the problems of gold in the past, which coming back to the, the historical issues of, with gold is that it's not easy to send anywhere around the world, for example's sake. So what would happen is you might have a vault storing it and then settling across those vaults. Like say you, you're buying from some shop and whatever this gold, let's say it was a full reserve world and that gold bank transferred. But then the problem now is that that gold bank or gold vault is centralized. It can now be co-opted. It could now be raided by the government. It could be regulated, so on and so forth. Bitcoin changes that because it's much cheaper in a defensive sense. Everyone can store their own keys and people can set up ways that make it hard for it to be harder for it to be stole, for you to be stolen from. So an example that might be multi-signature transactions. You could store your bitcoins in a multi-signature type um, using multi-signature such that you would need to compromise multiple parties like maybe yourself plus your friend plus your vault storage plus the company that sort of thing in order to compromise or steal your bitcoins so that that is a interesting concept as well i think the other point that's really important to understand with bitcoin is its anti-fragility so that is this concept of gaining from disorder so as bitcoin gets attacked people identify a weakness and then the bitcoiners and the coders and the developers and other people in the bitcoin space run around and basically harden bitcoin up against that they will find ways to maybe to try and help fix that problem whether it's scalability whether it's fungibility privacy we're going to see that coming out more and more over the future so in that sense it's it's like a hydra that if you cut off one head it's just going to sprout another two heads and that's an important aspect to understand with bitcoin as well so i think they're they're mostly the key points that i wanted to touch on from the book but in summary i would say it's the best succinct explanation of the economics behind bitcoin and why it's so important because in the past if you really want to get to this level of understanding you had to read from all these different sources so as an example you might have had to read murray rothbard what has the government done to our money Gita hulsman's the ethics of money production uh, various other pieces of work that have been done by other people in the bitcoin space to even get to this level but now, if you're a newcomer to this space, you just read this one book and that will get you pretty much up to speed in terms of early 2018, where we are in our understanding of Bitcoin. So um, hopefully that helps you guys. Uh, and I will definitely leave the link in the description if you're interested. Um, I would encourage you guys to get the book and um, yeah, let me know your thoughts. Thanks guys.